Well, welcome to Sunday School. Um, it's a beautiful weekend, and it's wonderful to be together. How many love Jesus this morning? Amen. Yeah, you know, I really, before we clap, I really tried to start this morning without saying that, <laughs> but it's kind of my, my saying. I just, it's important to me that we recognize how good Jesus is. So let me ask it again. How many love Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, good. Praise the Lord. I have a lesson this morning that we'll get into, picking up from where we left off in May. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to pray. But before we do that, I want to reread a passage of Scripture that Shabaka read Wednesday night just to kick off our Sunday. You know, Sunday school is the first meeting that we have, and then that kicks off a full day of hearing the Word of God, of being together as the people of God and getting to worship together. And we understand this, and I, I, I understand this myself, about myself, and then I'm sure this, you will concur with this as well. Many times we come into the service like this, all of us having a variety of experiences throughout the week, um, you know, different circumstances having arised in our life, different attitudes that we bring into the meeting like this. Sometimes those attitudes and our condition and our emotions are just riding high. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Everything's going great and you feel like you're on the mountaintop. I drew that the last time. No whiteboard today. But you feel like you're on the mountaintop and you could conquer anything. Then sometimes you're just kind of in the middle where, you know, life's good, but there's challenges, there's family, there's kids, but everything's going along, just kind of steaming along, normal. And then sometimes we do find ourselves coming into Sunday morning, having some valley experiences, having some circumstances that were extra challenging, maybe uh, some emotional switches pushed and just all kinds of things. So we come in and we just even, has anybody ever wondered, God, where are you today? Has anybody ever had that thought? God, are you even here today? I've had those kinds of thoughts, and so I realized that in a, a family of this size, and again, Sunday school, this is about half or less, a family of this size, we're all going to come in with different types of places and coming in with different types of experiences through the week. But I know this, I know that I know that I know this, no matter how we come in this morning, and I've said this before, but it's so true, we all have one thing in common today one thing in common if you're on the mountaintop or in the valley if you've had a great week or a terrible week we all have one thing in common and that is that we all desperately need Jesus desperately I mean if I had I haven't had like I can't come in here today and say I've had like a mountaintop week I've kind of been in the middle I haven't really had a bad week either things have been fine things have been good go along but I stand before you today with a full recognition. I stood at the altar Wednesday night. I, I'm trying to answer every altar call that I can in this season because I need Jesus. I need him. And when Shabaka read that passage on Wednesday night out of Hebrews, and this isn't my lesson, and I hope I don't take too much time out of my lesson for this, but out of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 through don't turn there, just listen to this. I want to remind us what was read. The Word of God is so very, very important that we get it inside of us. And, and the title of this in my Bible says, Our Compassionate High Priest. How many recognize that we have a compassionate high priest that we serve? We recognize that sometimes more times than others. But here's what the Word says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Everybody say fast. fast. That means we've got to hold on. Let us hold fast our confession. Don't give up. Hold fast. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in, on, I, I love this, I love this, I love this, but was in all points tempted as we are, and I love this even more, yet without sin. So Jesus knows what we're going through. Jesus experienced all the emotions. He experienced all the temptations and all the testings. Yet, praise the Lord, he never sinned. He's a faithful high priest. 
So going on, here's the verse 16 that Mr. Williams read. Let us therefore, everybody say therefore, therefore. come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And as we begin this day, we're not just beginning Sunday school, but we're beginning this, this Sunday day as the family of God coming before our Father, knowing that we have a faithful high priest who did not sin. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he who saved us, he who is saving us, and he who will save us, says that we can come before his throne. Now, I don't know completely what it means to come boldly all the time, but I know this, for all of us today, that means we can come before him. And we can ask him for grace and the mercy that we need this morning. Not just, can I tell you this this morning, family? Not just so we can get by today, but so that we can thrive in him. So that we can have life in him. That's what he wants for you, men. That's what he wants for you, ladies. That's what he wants for us, church. It's not that we just come to his throne so that we can get merely by. But he came that we might have life and life more abundantly. So God, right now, as we stand before you and we begin this day, this day that you have made, Lord, your word says also that your mercies are new every morning. That tells me every morning we can come before your throne no matter what we have faced. And we know we come before a faithful high priest, our advocate, our intercessor that is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we can come before you with boldness, with security, knowing that you know how we feel, you know what we've been through, not just because you see it, but you yourself were tempted in every way, yet you did not sin. Lord, as we stand here before you as men and women of God, if we have sin in our life, we repent even in this moment. Lord, we don't want to carry that any longer. We repent, and we ask you to forgive us and to clear us and to clean us, to purify our minds and cleanse our hearts, God. We ask for that even in this moment, God, that we, Lord Jesus, would worship you freely and not have that guilt or shame or anything hanging over us, God. That's not what you want for us, God. You don't want that for us, God, but you have freedom. So today, even as we begin Sunday school, we lift our hands to you and we say that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you are the righteous one, the son of God, the line of the tribe of Judah, our everything, our Lord and our Savior. And God, we don't want to get stuck in tradition. We don't want to get stuck in religion. We want to get stuck in you. It's in you we live and move and have our being. So Jesus, come and have your way this morning. We love you. We love you. We love you. And we thank you that you're the lifter of our heads. You pull us up out of the miry clay. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, as I said, that's typically how I start out every morning, back there in the chairs. You know, we all face things, and so it's good just to come before his throne and say, God, I need your mercy today. I need your grace today. None of us have our act together. Can I tell you that? None of us, even if you see us walking around in a suit or whatever, hey, it's just clothing. We all face the same things, and that is that we desperately need Jesus. Hi, Taz, Karen. We have our friends Taz and Karen here today. Praise God. I should say friend and family. We'll also have another family walking in at some point at, for church that they're from Thailand, and so they'll be with us today, so be sure and see them and greet them if you can. I began a series in May called Vision Administration. And I, I look, I've already, I'm nine minutes behind, so here we go. Better said, uh, the title that I like to use is that we're, we're being a church. We want to be a church that is led by vision and guided by administration. So I'm going to pick up by going through some review. My goal is to get through three and a half pages of the eight pages that I have. That's my goal today. And we said last time that it's necessary to be, for being a healthy church. How many want to be a healthy church? Amen. How many want to be a healthy individual? Yeah. Well, how you become a healthy individual is you become part of a healthy church. And how you have a healthy church is you be a healthy individual. Hey, good. Thank you, Martha. 
you get added points today, okay? So we said that the last time, and I had the whiteboard, that to be a healthy church, you have to have both vision and administration working together and complementing one another. You have to have both. I gave some definitions last time, and I said this, that a definition of vision is, it is the ability to see. Everybody say see. see. So vision, see. It is the ability to see what it is that is in God's heart. That's what we're after. That's the what. We want to see in the earth produced what it is that is in God's heart. Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay, that's what vision is. Then a definition of administration is this. It is the plans. It is the strategy that we put into place to accomplish the vision. So it's plans and strategies. This can be meetings like we're having right now. This is part of our strategy, okay, of building family, of being the churches that we gather together, and it's quite biblical, okay? So it's a godly strategy. We want to continue to find those God ideas to help in our administration and strategy. So again, this can be everything from meetings, the timings that we do things, businesses, callings, groupings, programs, etc. Again, this is the how to accomplish the what. So administration helps us accomplish vision. Okay, that's the goal. The goal is vision, what's in God's heart, and administration and structure helps us, facilitates accomplishing that. Now, it's very, very important then, and I've, I spoke the last time, and you guys will remember this, when applying the KISS principle. Does anybody remember the KISS principle? How many remember it? Raise your right hand. No, your right hand. There you go. Tricked you. Okay, your right hand. KISS stands for? Ah, yeah, you guys, you guys mix that up. Okay, no kids in here today. I don't see any. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay. So I like things simple. I had the privilege last weekend of going down to my roots, southern Missouri and the Ozarks and hillbilly country. And so I love keeping it simple, stupid. And we said that God's heart, while there's much in this Bible to say about that, it can really be summed up, I believe, in two things. The first one is, what's in God's heart, is that he reveal himself. God is a revealer. Praise God for that. How many are glad that one day God revealed himself to you personally? Okay. God's greatest revelation of himself, well, God's revelation of himself is here, and one, the greatest revelation of himself was in his son, Jesus Christ. Okay. And he gave us great gifts called the Holy Spirit and his word okay, to continue that out on this earth. But God is a revealer of himself, and if we had time to go into all that, I would, I would like to talk about that more, but we've done that in detail, that God is a revealer of himself. He did say in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, let's, I, I don't want to, you know, I was, I was going to, because I'm running out of time, I was going to gloss over the scripture, and I'm going to refrain from doing that. This is Sunday school, and we want to get the Bible in here and give it its preeminent place. And so Ephesians, if you'll turn with me, we'll take whatever time we need to take, to the book of Ephesians, let's look at that, okay? And again, we're in review, but let's look at the Word of God. I don't want you to just to take my word for it. How many are enjoying our reading program? Right. Own it 365. We are, as a family. Here's what it says about God. Again, we said that one of his things is in his heart is to reveal himself. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17 says, For this reason I too... Having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Then here's the, the verse, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Everybody say ever revelation. The word revelation in the knowledge of him. Hallelujah. God wants to reveal himself and share himself with his creation. Habakkuk 2.14, don't turn there, but it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge, the knowing of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then in our reading, if you've been reading this week, one of our passages was in John 17, and I really love the reading this week. You cannot go wrong by starting with the book of John, number one. It's a wonderful book. But then number two, 
this, this verse, John 17, 3, says this. It says, this is eternal life. Now, when I think of eternal life, when you think of eternal life, what's the first thing your mind goes to? What's that? Heaven, living forever, right? Eternity, hey, we're going to live forever. But look what the Word of God says eternal life is. This is eternal life, that they may know you. Praise God. That eternal life, yes, we're going to live forever. Yes, we're going to live in heaven, but eternal life is this, knowing Jesus, praise God. Uh, Eternal life is having a relationship with God as our Father. It's wonderful. Second, the second thing, the first thing is God's heart is to reveal himself. The second thing is this, it is God's heart to have a people of his very own. Titus 2.14 says, Again, don't turn there for sake of time. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us, this is speaking of Jesus, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. What wonderful news. How many are glad that God owns us? Okay, We're not just a member of, We belong to him. It's not just a club. It's not just something you join. It's something that we're connected to him. It's something that we belong to him. He owns us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says this, Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and will walk among them. And, And here's the great news, I will be their God, and they shall be my po- excuse me, they shall be my people. You see, God's ultimate desire is to reveal himself as father to his children. We talked about that this week in our chapel at the Bible college with the Bible college students. That's so hard to grasp and understand, and I've been very transparent with you in the past in my own life, how hard it is sometimes to grasp. It's easy to grasp that he's God that he's creator, but it's harder to grasp sometimes, especially based upon some of our experiences, that he's also a loving, amazing, gracious father. But that's what his desire is, because if you go down two more verses to verse 18 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, this is what it says. This is what he says about himself. And I will be a father to you. How many want God to be your father today? Let me say it this way. Do you understand? What God really wants you to understand today is that he is your father. He is your father, and he desires to have that kind of relationship with you. He says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we've also previously noted that vision primarily, again, we're in review here, primarily addresses that which is eternal. In other words, it's unchanging. While administration of this vision in the earth is temporal. That means it can change. Administration's structure can change. And we've been seeing some changes around here, and that's okay. That's okay as long as the vision, as long as the heart of God, as long as that that is eternal, which is knowing him, doesn't change. The pursuit of that. Meeting times can change. Jobs can change. How we do things can change, etc. And a great example I gave last time of that was the difference between the calling of being a son of God or a daughter of God. Are you ladies glad you're daughters of God today? Praise God, we are too. But there's a difference between being a daughter of God, which is an eternal relationship as a calling, and the calling of an evangelist. Okay, that's a calling as well, but that's an administration that's temporary for this earth. There won't be evangelists in heaven Okay, and so that's something that will pass away, that calling. So that's an administration that's in this earth to accomplish God's vision. That's just one example. I really do believe, and the reason we're taking two Sundays, I've got two Sundays in July, and then I leave for Moldova. So in these two Sundays, I st- why I wanted to con- finish this up, I really believe that it's very Im- important for us as a church, it's very significant for us to understand both the roles of vision and administration, how important they are, but to keep them in their proper perspective. Both are vitally important. So picking up where we left off last time, I I really want to say 
while I believe the most, if I could say this, they, they work together, but, and if you have one, I did the chart one without the other, then uh, you're not healthy, but we gotta get the vision right. And then we gotta get the administration right. We gotta get the administration right to support the vision. And so which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, we don't know, okay? Some think chicken, some think God could have made an egg if he wanted to. I, could God make an egg if he wanted to? I suppose he could. He could have made an egg and then the chicken popped out. So we don't know which, we just need both working together. But administration is very, very, very important. But, everybody say but. but. I won't say like the pastor said one time, say a big but. We won't say that, okay? I won't have you say a big but, okay? But, but, all right? We have to be careful. We must be very careful that administration does not take on a life of its own. Administration is there to complement. Administration is there to support. Administration is there to help so produce. But it's not there to take on a life of its own. This can happen so subtly, and we're going to talk about this today. One of the ways it can happen is if I were... And I've done this, but when we're talking about church, many times, and there's many ways that administration can take on a life of its own, but one little example, and there's many more you could think of, is when we think of the word church. Well, we have an understanding out of Scripture and as the people of God that when we say church, we're talking about who? Who are we talking about? People, right? We're talking about people, the people of God. I have in my life, this was, honestly, I'll tell you, going all the way back, this was a, a, a really great revelation to me when I first got born again and saved. If you would have asked me and you said the word, uh, where do you go to church? Anybody ever heard that phrase, question, where do you go to church? I would have said, Montgomery City, uh, Calvary Assembly of God, okay? Where's your church? Well, it's in Montgomery City because my mind would go to a place. My mind would go to a building. Anybody ever done that? Okay. Many of us have done that. That's an administration, okay? Admin that's an administration. Where you meet, a building just facilitates. We have a nice building here. And praise God, we want to build a church someday, okay? Someday sooner than later. Well, as wonderful as that building will be and look, and we want to do it all in excellence and to the glory of God, at the end of the day, it's just brick. It's just a building. We understand biblically and scripturally that the church is us. The church is the family of God, the people of God. However, this is an area that we've got to be careful in because there are people, we've got to be careful ourselves, but there are people who exalt the building even above the souls that fill the building. Okay? That is true. There are people who do that. That's just one small example of how we can allow administration and structure to take on a life of its own and to be exalted above what God plans for it to be. It's just a supplement. It's just a complement. It's just a structure. So it's important to keep this in order. So to do this, I want to introduce to you a couple of more words that I think can help us with keeping the proper perspective on both administration and structure. And they are these words, okay? The word organism. Everybody say organism. Okay, or say a little bit louder so you're convinced me you heard me. Organism. All right, thank you. And then the word organization. Let me hear you say organization. Okay, so we're going to look at the difference between organism and organization. Now, the first one, the definition of organism is this. It's life. If you look it up in the dictionary, one of the first words you'll see is it says life. Or it goes on to say that's that which carries the activities of life, comma, a living being. It is where we get the word, how many have heard the word organic? Have you heard the word, it's really popular right now around the world, food and stuff like that, but it's where we get the word organic, okay? It's that that produces life, that that is life, a living being. Now, the word, the definition for the word organization from where we get the word organize, okay? One word is organic, one word is organized. One word is organism, the other word is organization. And I might add here that organization is synonymous with the word administration, and here's the definition. It's to give an organic structure. Everybody say structure, okay? 
It is to give an organic structure, any systematic whole. It's a system. It goes on to say it's an association or an executive structure. So organism is about life, and organization is about structure. And I want to say here that what God is after producing is that which is eternal, which that is which, which is life. About got tongue twisted there, but what God is after is producing life. He's after producing the organic. And structure then exists solely to support this. Does that make sense to you this morning? Okay, so we've got a living organism, and we've got organization that supports the living organism. And can I tell you this morning that the church is a living organism. It has life. It contains the very life of God. One of the pictures I think of, and it might be a, not a very good picture, but it's what pops in my mind, is when God created Adam, the very first man, it says that he formed him out of the dust of the earth, and he, what he did was he made some bones and flesh. He made a structure, and it was just a structure. There was no life to it. He just, made, he just drew it out, and it was there. But then it says, and it doesn't say that he bent low, but then it says that he breathed into his nostrils what? Everybody say it. Life. And so God is the life giver. And our vision is all about that that produces life, that that is eternal, which one of the pieces in there, primary pieces in there, is the church itself. The church is a living organism of which the life of God resides in. We remember one of our favorite pas- one of our pastor's favorite passages. We read it this week was the conversation where Jesus says that God will come. His whole purpose in designing us, his whole purpose in making us was that God would come and make his home. One other translation is make his abode in us. Praise God. Men, do you- That's one of the greatest things that you'll come to understand as a child of God is that your father is not sitting on a throne just high and lofty, far off, disconnected from you, but his design for your life is to come by his spirit and live on the very inside of you. That's powerful. That changes everything on how we live. And so, again, the vision, the heart of God is, is this relationship, father, children, family, church. That's what we're producing, and then the structure complements it. So we're after the life of God. We're after the, if I could say it this way, we're after the breath of God. We're after his voice. We're after his presence. And yes, we can even feel that at times. But even when we don't feel it, we have faith in him that he's here, living inside of us. He's real. But again, this is where we've got to be careful. We can get off in this. We can get off. It's too easy sometimes to be led. It's easier sometimes to be led by organization. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy that likes structure. Not as much as Martha does, but Martha likes to put structure to things. And it's great. We need it. I love structure. I'm a very systemized person. I like my ducks in a row. Any ducks in a row people here today? Okay, I like my ducks in a row. I like the trash can goes within three centimeters of the same spot every time. So when I pull my car in the garage, I know exactly how to curve it in. I like that. If it's four centimeters off, I might bump my mirror on it. I like structure. But can I tell you, this morning, I love Jesus. And structure just supports stuff. Structure is not the goal. And that's, that's where we got to be careful because... It can sound, this is how it can sound when we're starting to give too much attention to structure. These are, these are little things that can pop in our mind and questions. It, it's, it's like, uh, we must meet at this time. We must look this way. We must have this kind of meeting or this kind of building to be successful. We must have this kind of music. We must have these kinds of instruments. I mean, we just got to be careful. Very, very, very careful. Because this kind of thinking that we've got to have this or we've got to have this or we've got to have this about the administration side of things, the structure side of things, it can actually backfire on you. And it can suck the very life out of you instead of complementing the life that it's trying to sustain. Does that make sense? Okay. So we've got to be careful what we focus on. We don't want to focus on the structure. 
We don't want to focus on the building. We don't want to focus on timings and things like that. We want to show up. We want to be there. We want to be on time and those kinds of things out of excellence. But the focus is when I come is Jesus. The focus is God himself. The focus is his life that he wants to produce in us. And I believe that we have help with this. I know that we do. It's not just I believe it. It's biblical. We have help with getting off focus from the enemy of our soul. And I believe that the enemy of our soul and of this church will work overtime to come against us experiencing life. John 10.10 says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Yet Jesus has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. And while many times he comes against our vision and our big picture, he's very good at it. The Bible also says he's like a lion that sneaks around and prowls around and then he's ready to roar and jump on us and take us out. And so he's very good at being subtle and in the small ways getting in through how we see administration. It's one of the ways he works. He's very, very good at it. The enemy will subtly pick away at the structure of things. He will whisper in our ears such things as this. Hey, you know, that music is too loud and fast. That's just, too, that's, that's, that's just not God. That's, that's too fast. Why do we have so many meetings? Again, I'm talking about the enemy. I'm not asking you. These are questions that the enemy can come in to our ear and just whisper. So why do you have so many meetings? Why do they take the offering at that time? How come he gets a truck? Can, you understand a truck's just an administration? It just gets you to somewhere. It's the somewhere, it's the destination we're wanting to get. It's not the truck. Why did they get that house? Why does she have that position? This is a Bible college one. Why do we have curfew? Curfew is just an administration. It's not an eternal thing. Jesus stays up all night. Why do we have curfew? Why do the ushers ask me to sit here? <laughs> I had to get that one in there. Why do they ask to sit? That's just an administration, folks. Just a structure. There's reasons we like the front rows filled because we got things going on on TV and just, just different reasons and don't waste the seats in the back and all that but it's just an administration that we tend to let the enemy whisper in our, or our flesh whisper from outside of us you know this, and we get focusing on this structure instead of focusing on what we're supposed to be focusing on and he's good at using how we administrate things to try and bring division now when I was a boy I grew up in church, and as you know my testimony, I didn't bow my knees to Jesus until I was 21 years old, sadly. But I grew up in church. And I can remember about 10, 11 years old, growing up in church, very used to everything, sat next to a guy named Carl who had every page in the hymnal memorized. So if the song leader said, turn to page 292, he'd learn it, lean to me and say, this is what he's going to say. And he'd give me the title. He had it all memorized. We, I grew up with hymnals. But... In the early 70s, that tells you my age, when I was about 10 or 11, I remember when our church brought in the very first transparency with overhead. And we sang our very first chorus instead of singing out of the hymnal. Oh my goodness. There was shaking, there was rocking, there was, I'll just be honest with you, there was division. It was just an overhead. It was just another administration. But can I tell you, there are people, I've been one of them, I've got my own. So when I say there are, I'm not excluding myself from that, that put a higher stock and value on administration and such things like that than they do the souls and the friendships and the family members that they're dividing with. Guys, it's just a structure. So whether we have overhead or what if one Sunday Darren came in here and said, and passed out all hymnals, and we're going to go back to hymnals. Would that rock our boat? Would that be a good thing, a bad thing? Would some of us go, what in the world? Some of us would go, hallelujah, we're getting saved now. We're going back to the good old time religion, right? It's just an administration. 
I'm having a little fun here, but it's a very serious thing because this is where the enemy subtly, everybody say subtly. It's actually not spelled like it sounds, by the way. It's got a B in there. Subtly. The enemy is very subtle at what he does. And can I tell you, in this day, he would love nothing more than to bring division in this house. He'll divide to try to conquer. And he won't, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, he won't come at the vision first. Our pastor did a great job of painting vision. Pastor Chris is doing a great job, and all the others that preach from this pulpit, of painting vision. We want Jesus. We want God. We want his heart. But he'll come, and he'll start putting he'll, little thorns, and he'll start pushing on your side, and he'll start irritating you about administrative things, how much you make, or, or where you live, or or, or where you serve at 4th of July, all kinds of things like that. He's good at it. Right. He's very good at it. And again, his goal isn't just to make you irritated. His goal is to kill, steal, and destroy your soul. Amen. And his goal is to kill, steal, and destroy and divide this church. Right. And it will not, I'm telling you, it will not happen because vision is attacked overnight. It will happen because he'll subtly get in. The Bible says, foxes, little, how's it, what is that? Little Little foxes spoil the vine. I almost said little vine spoil the fox. But little foxes spoil the vine. And so again, I think that's why I've been speaking on it. It's very, very important to us to understand vision, administration, all that kind of stuff. But I really believe there is a call. I really believe it's important for us in this day to recognize that we must major on the major and minor on the minor. A lot of church splits happen because we major on the minors. Now, I'm not even trying to pretend like I think there's a church. It's, that's not the point. But this is how you avoid it. You talk about stuff like this. Amen. Let's not give the enemy any room, amen? amen? Let's not listen to those little voices that says, well, why do they have, or what is that, or why, how come we don't have carpet, and, you know? This is a true story. My grandfather about got voted out of a church because he bought the wrong furnace for the building. Yeah, it, it sounds funny now. 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't funny. Do you know those things happen in churchdom? Yes. It does. Yes. And it doesn't seem like, well, that would ever happen here. Yes, it can. Amen. If we get focused on the wrong thing and we, and we focus on the, the, the administration and the organization and the structure instead of focusing on Jesus and the life that he wants to breathe in this place. The Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 2.11, we've got to be wise to the enemy's tactics and it says, Paul said, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We must not be ignorant of the devil's schemes in this day. One more thing. I think I'm going to draw a good closing line here for next week. You see, and I know I've been kind of, but this is the truth. This is, this is the reality. When we truly give ourselves to being a living organism, when being, having the life of God is what leads us. And again, that means being family, caring the life of God, loving one another, caring for one another. When we gather together, it's not about the time, it's about the who. It's about the who. First and primary, him, and then one another. What this will produce, what this should and will cause is for us, when that's our focus, it will cause us to have an interdependence, a knitting of the hearts together, and a real desire as we step into our place, even as we come up on our celebration tomorrow night, it'll cause us all to step in our place, no matter what our title through the week, no matter what our position through the week, we all together as a family will step into place, locked arms, locked, locked hearts, to serve the community. The Bible says this is how they'll know you're my disciples. The way you administrate so well together. No. The way you love one another. This, that is the greatest evangelistic tool we have. The greatest evangelistic tool we have is not tracks. It's our very lives and how we love one another. And praise God, we're going to have people coming from all the different counties and stuff. And so we have an opportunity as we're interdependent to 
and we, we have a desire to serve, and, and what it produces, we compliment. Everybody say compliment. We compliment one another. Maybe I'm a toe, maybe I'm a finger, maybe I'm a thumb, maybe I'm a nose, whatever on the, so what? I'm part of the body, praise God. And Jesus is the head. And so whatever my part is, I compliment all the other parts. And so men, my heart, our heart, everybody else here, women, as you're here in the program, our desire is that you succeed, that you do well, that you really get to know Jesus and love God and fulfill your call on the earth. And whatever we can do to serve you and to be a part of that, we want to do. We, I know it's hard to believe when you're sitting in those chairs because there is things you need to do in the discipleship side of things, but I want to remind us we are a family, right. and it doesn't matter where you sit in this church. That's what God's wanting to produce. That's what produces life, and we complement each other. However, however, if we give ourselves to merely being an organization and being led by administration, what this will cause, what this will breed, instead of interdependence, this will breed independence. And instead of complementing one another, it will cause division. And because what typically happens in organization, can I tell you the difference between a living or, one, of the, one of the fruits of being an organization or being an organism, as I've seen this over 36 years of even working in industry and things? I've been a, a part of plenty of organizations. And again, you've heard me say now for the fifth week, organization and administration is very important when it's in its right perspective and place. It complements, it supplements, it supports. Structure's good. I've been in plenty of organizations in my life. And if the organization is the goal and not the life of God, the living organism, what this produces, instead of complementing one another, Okay, we compete against one another. Okay, did you hear that? In an organization, if that's your goal, I worked at a company for many, many years. I watched it happen. If you're, a, I was a manager, fellow managers, they didn't compliment one another, another. Mostly, they competed against one another because they wanted the promotions. And with promotions comes what? More money, more status. People in factories and things would, it's an organization, it's where you go work, but their goal wasn't producing excellence in life. Many times our goal was making more money, getting promotions, and so we naturally compete against one another in an organization. Now, competition in its right place is okay. I love sports, I love baseball, and having that competitive nature has a place too, okay? I'll outrun any of you guys. I used to be able to. Yeah, I already saw one of you was ready to put your tennis shoes on. But in an organization, when that's our focus, it tends to breed and cause us to be competitive. Do you know we see that in churchdom? And that's one of the number one ways that the enemy subtly gets in and causes division. Okay, is when we focus on these, these structural, organizational, administrative things. And instead of us, me being out for Lee's best, it's like, well, you know, Lee's his suit actually looks nicer than mine today. And he's, he actually is more distinguished looking than me. Got the mustache going and, you know, he's married Jan. They're doing great. And it's like, yeah, and he's in the men's. I, I don't know, that Lee, I, I just kind of, a little suspicious of him. Is he trying to work his way into whatever I got going on? You don't think that can happen? Yeah. And can I tell you today, church, it can happen to me if I get my eyes on the organization. Can we stand? God, I ask today, I ask for myself, I ask for us as a church, I ask for every individual believer in here and those who are supposed to bow their knees to Jesus today. God, I ask for us that you would help us. Lord, I know this has come out somewhat strong and edgy, God, but Lord, I believe you're passionate about your people. I know you're passionate about your people. I know you're passionate about your church. I know you're passionate about producing life, your life in us and in this region that others around us would be attracted to Heartland Community Church, not because it has the nicest buildings in the area, not because it has a great place to get a steak. That's fine and good. But because it has a people there that love one another 
and that love you, God. God, we ask you today, would you work that into us? Where we get off, would you come, Holy Spirit, and remind us that we're not merely an organization, but we are a living organism, a church, a people of God, children of yours that are to produce life as we serve you. God, we thank you for your word. We hold it up and we esteem it highly. We thank you that your word comes and it, it, it challenges us, it envisions us, it provokes us. And yes, Lord, where we need it, it corrects us. God, we love you. Come on, if you love him, just raise your hand. If you love him right now, God, as we go into this next part of the, this meeting, God, to worship you, we want to dedicate to worship you with the very best heart that we can. We want to give you the very best worship we can today, and Lord, we're ready to receive, I believe, from Mauricio this morning, God, your word planted in the, in the depths of our heart, God. God, we want you to produce life in heartland. Come, Lord Jesus, in this day and move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.